this information. As you may know, the IOP hosts an ongoing series of discussions that seek to elevate and expand the public conversation and cultivate the next generation of leaders. Tomorrow, we're gonna to welcome the Washington Post Robert Costa to campus. He's gonna be serving as the final uh, fellow of the IOP this quarter. And on Thursday, he's moderating discussion on the future of the Republican Party. There's gonna be a continuation of our uh, America in the Trump era series. You can find more about this event and all of our upcoming events at politics.uchicago.edu. During our conversation tonight, we're gonna to open up the floor to take questions from the audience. Just as a reminder um, that students get priority for the first three questions. And uh, when we get to the time for questions, there's gonna be two students with microphones, so just raise your hand and they'll come to you. I also wanna thank International Harps for their partnership on this program and their continued support of the IOP. Um, also, now's a good time to make sure your phone is on silent, please. And here to formally introduce our guest is Kirk Lancaster. Kirk is a third year in the college, majoring in chemistry. Uh, he is the US section editor for the IOP's political review, The Gate. Please join me in welcoming Kirk to the podium. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Christine, for the introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Craig Silverman of BuzzFeed for tonight's discussion of fake news. Um, after last November's election, um, our nation has found itself in something of a fake news crisis, uh, which threatens to lead us into what some people are calling um, a era of post-truth politics. Uh, with everything from low barriers to entry for creating new content in uncontrolled media and factors of hyperpartisanship and confirmation bias, fake news is certainly a complex problem to unravel. Few, however, uh, would be more prepared to take on that task than Craig Silverman. Mr. Silverman, an award-winning journalist and entrepreneur, is currently the media editor of BuzzFeed News, where he leads a global beat covering online platforms, misinformation, and the economic incentives behind online content. In 2004, Mr. Silverman founded Regret the Error, a column for the Pointer Institute that reports on fact checking and media inaccuracies, and he also wrote a book of the same name. In 2014, during a fellowship with uh, Columbia University's Tau Center for Journalism, uh, Mr. Silverman launched an online startup called Emergent, a data-driven tracker that follows and debunks online hoaxes. At BuzzFeed, he has published a number of articles about fake news, from a story about the flourishing fake news industry in Macedonia, to a profile of Canadian teens creating stories about Justin Trudeau. His work has been recognized for a number of honors, including the Mira Awards and the Canadian National Magazine Awards. So tonight, please help me welcome Mr. Craig Silverman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's wonderful. I haven't been to Chicago many times. It's, it's great to be here. It's kind of amazing that if, I don't know, five months ago I had suggested, hey, why don't I do a talk about fake news, people would have been like, what is that? And why should I care about that? Uh, so it's, it's been a, a busy few months. Uh, I think the term fake news itself has almost been rendered meaningless at this point, perhaps. Uh, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And so hopefully tonight I can maybe offer a little bit of clarity, at least in terms of how I see fake news and, and how I define it but also just what I call kind of the online misinformation ecosystem as well. Um, you know, what are the, who are the big players in that? What's, what are some examples of the stuff that we're seeing? Because, you know, if you have a sort of way of defining the different types of things you see, maybe you can identify it a little bit better. So giving a sense of that is one of the things I want to do. Talk a little bit about the election and why I view it as kind of a perfect storm for misinformation and really represents a lot about what's going on in media and information today. Uh, and, and look at kind of the larger trends of, of why all that's happening. So that's, that's the plan. I'm, I'm really excited to take some questions and have some discussion with all of you as well. Um, uh, so to start, I wanted to go through a kind of a case study here. Now, um, is, this, is this story familiar to folks here? Is this something you've seen before? 
So, and if, and if it's not this specific story, you may have, you know, this concept of paid protesters is probably familiar to you, right? And so this is a story from a fake news website, uh, ABC news.com.co. It's run by a guy in Arizona named Paul Horner, who, um, you know, he makes a living from this. Uh, and, and so this was a story that he originally published in October. The date on this story is November because it did so well, he decided to just change the date on it and, like, throw it out again. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, when it succeeds, you just do it again. That's, that's how folks operate in this world. Uh, and so this was a story he put up. It did really well for him. Uh, it performed very well on Facebook, which is a, like the biggest driver of, of traffic to news websites. Uh, and, and in addition to kind of putting the story up, he also created a fake Craigslist ad to kind of back it up. And, and so when people went looking to see, well, is this real or is this not, there was a Craigslist ad that other people might see. And so back in October, when this went out there, the, this idea of paid protesters wasn't such a big thing. It's not like it had never existed before, but it wasn't such a big thing. And this story, this completely fake story, sort of started to generate discussion around this. Um, and, oops, sorry, there we go. Uh, and it, it fooled some important people. Um, so the story was shared by two of Donald Trump's campaign managers, Corey Lewandowski, um, Kellyanne Conway, both shared it, both tweeted it out. Uh, she deleted her tweet about five, five minutes after it went out, because I saw it, and I, I tweeted it, and I said, oh my god, a presidential campaign manager just tweeted fake news. Uh, and I guess that got back to her, because she deleted it soon after that. And Donna Donald Trump shared it as well. Donald Trump's sons shared it as well. So, uh, so this is really important for, for misinformation. When, when people in positions of power and authority share it and put it out there, that adds to its perception of credibility. And that's especially true for people like me who are journalists. When we fall for this stuff, I mean, that's just like, th that's a home run for folks creating these things. So the story comes out, it starts getting some traffic, uh, starts getting some traction, and, and so other websites start to kind of pick this up. Uh, and, and what we see is from this one story, this totally fake story claiming about a pay protester at a Donald Trump event, we start to see this being applied to lots of other protests. And so, you know, it just keeps happening. Um, you know, for example, there's this really famous tweet now where a guy was just, he was in Texas and he saw a bunch of buses and there was a protest against Trump nearby and he tweeted and said, hey, these buses were bringing in these paid protesters and that's not what was happening at all. And so what's happened is a completely fake idea has suddenly actually become the reality for a lot of people. And it just keeps happening, and people keep playing on this. Somebody set up this website a few weeks ago saying that they would pay protesters a monthly retainer of $2,500 to just like hang out and wait until a protest was ready. So that sounds like a great, I'm sure there's a lot of students here who are like, where do I sign up for that, <laughs> right? Uh, and, so, and, and so they made up this website. They created this whole thing, and they, they put, like, like Paul had done on Craigslist, they put ads in Backpage in different cities all around the US. Uh, and and you know, fortunately, at one point, um, uh, Tucker Carlson had one of the guys who had set this up on, and the guy thought he was fooling Tucker Carlson, and Tucker Carlson took him to the woodshed and was like, you've made this up, you're fake, your website's fake, uh, why are you doing this? And, and so you know, this is, this is um, you know, a claim that's often made more by conservatives about pay protesters on the left. But even in that case, Tucker Carlson of Fox News had had enough, and he said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to let this go any further. Uh, and, but it's, even still, that website, which was totally fake, got written up by a bunch of other sites and picked up into this kind of partisan atmosphere and these partisan sites that we'll talk about more in a second that are a really big part of getting misinformation out there. Um, and so the, the world of misinformation, it's not just fake news. That's the term, uh, and I have a specific way of defining that. I don't pretend like it's you know, the greatest way and the perfect way, but it's one way that I you know, look at it. And, and there are a lot of different players and a lot of different aspects to this, and it's important to get a sense of you know, what's going on with it. So um, one of them is a really long time source of misinformation, which is kind of official sources of propaganda. So like a state entity, um, for me, it's propaganda when it's politically or ideologically driven misinformation. Um, that's why they're creating it, is to you know, get an idea across to support their cause. And this is an example of it here. This is a photo from a few years ago. It was distributed by North Korea's uh, official news service. 
and it showed them doing a, a kind of a land invasion exercise. So it was you know, meant to strike some fear, perhaps, into people in South Korea. And news organizations that published this, they said, you know, this is from the state news agency there. This is them trying to show off their military capabilities. But even when we journalists were trying to flag it and tell people, like, yeah, this is, you know, this is sort of their piece of propaganda, we, we often we missed one thing, which is that uh, when people analyzed this photo a little more closely, they realized that a lot of these landing crafts, um, it was basically the same one just cloned over and over again in Photoshop. <laughs> Uh, and I think it was the same thing with some of the soldiers there. So, uh, so even though we tried to frame it properly, we missed out on one piece there. And that's, you know, that's the danger with this kind of stuff. Um, you know, some more current things that we see, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, about Russia during this, this past election. And Russia does run a very sophisticated uh, online propaganda and misinformation effort. Uh, I think when, when, when the invasion happened, in Ukraine, uh, and in the years ensuing from that, they really stepped up their efforts. And this is a couple examples here. I mean, so the one on the left, when MH17 was shot down over Ukraine, and all of the investigations that have come out after that have said it was a Russian missile launcher in, in you know, their separatist territory. Uh, so this is an example of the Russian Foreign Ministry put out a counter report, and the image on the left there is a satellite image of a plane, and they claim that, well, that's actually MH17 nowhere near where everyone says it was. And so Elliot Higgins, who's a, a wonderful uh, open source investigator, pointed out that, well, actually, the image you guys are using has the logo in the wrong place for a Malaysia Airlines flight, but nice try on that. And I think you actually, when you literally Google um, if you Googled like Malaysia Airlines flight, that was one of the first images that came up. So it wasn't a very sophisticated attempt, but this, the, the approach that Russia uh, employs is, is often described as a fire hose of falsehood, is they put out a lot of stuff and trying to create confusion. It's not even necessarily convincing you of their point of view, but it's just can we muddy the waters enough that there's confusion for people. So propaganda is still uh, you know, a very active thing online. Uh, and then we have people who just kind of want to, you know, throw a, a monkey wrench in the system a little bit. Uh, and, you know, this was a few weeks ago when Queen Elizabeth hadn't been seen. She had a cold. She missed an event. There were a bunch of Twitter accounts pretending to be BBC News and just started tweeting that she was dead. Uh, and this happens a lot. The death hoax is, is alive and well. Uh, and the one on the left is a Twitter account from someone who actually turned out to work in politics in New York saying that the New York Stock Exchange had been flooded during Hurricane Sandy. And that was not true. And this was somebody who had a lot of followers and who'd built up a following on Twitter just deciding to kind of make something up. Um, and so who are the people that, that do this? Well, this, is, this guy's one of them. His name is Tommaso De Benedetti. He is a school teacher in Italy. That's what his day job is. He likes to make up hoaxes in his spare time. Uh, <laughs> And he's so proud of it that after we debunked that queen hoax, he actually sent me this email saying, hey, by the way, that was me. Just so you know, Craig, that was me. Um, and so he's very proud of it, and he loves to reach out. He also did this thing years ago um, to, to, in his view, to show how irresponsible Italian media was. He invented a bunch of interviews with famous American novelists and sold them to Italian newspapers. So it was like him and Philip Roth in an interview, and it was completely made up. And he sold a bunch of them until the New Yorkers sort of pulled the, you know, pulled the cover off of him on this. So there are people like him who just kind of enjoy doing this. There are, there are trolls who just kind of enjoy causing trouble. They don't necessarily have an ideological motive, but they like to maybe fool the media and, and cause trouble out there. Uh, and, and another example of this is, uh, so this was something that happened in, in Canada where there was this video up on YouTube saying, there was a, sh a shark in Lake Ontario. Now, this is a freshwater lake, um, which is important to note. Uh, but this video went up, and it turned out that it was a PR campaign for the Shark Week for the Discovery Channel in Canada. Um, and actually, just like an hour or two ago, I, we published a story that there's, there's a Hollywood film opening this weekend that has actually been paying a guy who runs fake news websites to write fake news related to their film. Um, and we just, we just revealed that. So this is still, you know, it's still happening, amazingly, um, given all the attention around fake news. Um, so another really important category here are kind of the unintentional propagators. So what I mean here is people who genuinely think something is real or don't necessarily think about whether it's true or false, and they help put it out there. And this is what the hoaxers and people creating this stuff and, and people putting out propaganda really rely on. They want to fool you, and they want to get you to help it spread. It's very important in a networked world. This is a, a good example of it. This amazing photo 
uh, circulated a lot during Sandy. And, and this person, you know, not a journalist, just like average person on Facebook shared it, and it went crazy. Uh, when I took this screenshot, it had been shared almost 300,000 times, and the arrow is pointing to him at one point saying, oh, gosh, this is really taking off. Um, I asked the person who sent it to me, and they asked the person who sent it to them, and it turns out it's not true. I feel really bad. I'm sorry, you guys. And when he posted that, it had been shared about 100,000 times. So 200,000 more shares had happened on top of him when he realized, I'm sorry, it's not real. And so this is, this is a role for all of us, is to really think about the role we're playing uh, in passing along information and realizing that you know, each little share and each little like helps propel that stuff even further. Uh, and you know, it's not just regular folks. You do have official sources of information that are usually very trusted that unintentionally will we'll put stuff out that's not true. And this was you know, the Dallas Police Department implicating a completely innocent guy in those horrible shootings that had happened uh, a while ago. Um, he was somebody who was walking around open carrying legally in Dallas, um, but after the shootings happened, he actually handed his, his gun over to police officers so this wouldn't happen, and unfortunately, um, it still did. Uh, there's another category of folks who, uh, who are actively trying to, to push false stuff. Uh, and and you know they, they may be doing it for a variety of reasons, but they're really aware of what they're doing and they're pushing it as much as they can. Uh, and so this is an example from a few years ago here, uh, where and it, where basically at one point a bunch of people started tweeting this hashtag, uh, Colombian chemicals, saying there was an explosion in a chemicals plant in a part of Louisiana, and there was this screen grab from CNN. Um, and it turned out actually that there was no such plant there. Uh, that was a fake screen grab from CNN. And this was a, a hashtag that started trending on Twitter. And it started trending on Twitter um, thanks to tons and tons of accounts being run out of Russia um, just tweeting the hashtag like crazy. And this still happens a lot where uh, people will, will coordinate, tweet a hashtag as much as possible. And then what they often do to cover their tracks is they don't then go back and they delete all those tweets. And sometimes it's, it's bots, it's robot accounts that are, can tweet out stuff really quickly. But this is an example where you do see um, organized groups, whether it's from states or just you know, people uh, working together, uh, you know, people from 4chan or what have you, who try to create something and push it out. And, and in the end, it all kind of looks the same. Whether you're unintentionally propagating it or you're maliciously doing it, it still gets it out there. And, uh, and sometimes I think it's hard for people to kind of you know, recognize the difference. This is an example from the election where uh, a couple of, of folks from the alt-right decided to dig through the Podesta emails and take out references to food and pretend that they had to do with, you know, with child trafficking. Um, and this, this helped, this, these were two tweets that actually played a role in the Pizzagate stuff. Uh, and they decided every day this, you know, they woke up and they wanted to like create something. They wanted to get something trending. They, wa they wanted to have something that might stick on, on Hillary Clinton. And so it just happened to be one day they woke up and decided that you know, references to food were, were actually talking about child trafficking. Uh, and this turned into obviously a very big thing. Uh, so the, there's also the people you know, that I'm involved with and, and that, that I share some blame with as well, which are news websites. And so I did this research project in 2014 where I looked at how news websites were writing about rumors and unverified claims. Um, and this is when I actually started to notice these fake websites that looked like real news websites, but everything on it was made up. Uh, and so this is a story, I don't know if you remember this one, but as a woman went on Florida radio, said I'd had a, a third breast uh, uh, you know, added to my chest, and it's real, and news websites went crazy and wrote about it. And if you look at these headlines, they all talk about it like, yes, this actually happened. Uh, and the, all the research we have into headlines say that they actually create the whole framework for how someone uh, consumes all the subsequent information. So if you have a misleading headline, you can't really fix it in the body text. Um, and headlines, I think, are getting even more misleading these days. And so this was an example where a story, uh, just a, a woman had made this claim and nobody had proof for it. And they wrote headlines saying, yeah, this has really happened. And we analyzed the data here. Pardon me. Um, and so what you see on the top line there is the amount of social media engagement for stories that reported this as a true thing. And what you see in the lower graph there is um, stories that actually had come out and said, oh, it turns out sh this never happened. And, and as a side note, it was an amazing way. Nobody, a lot of people didn't believe it from, from day one. 
she wouldn't say who her doctor was. She refused to take photos and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the way she was busted was actually she had lost a bag at, I think, the Tampa airport. And when they found the bag, they needed to find out who it was. So they opened it up, and there was a prosthesis for three breasts in it. That was actually like what she had been wearing to make it seem like. So she got busted because she, you know, the airline lost her luggage, which maybe we can all identify with that. I don't know. Uh, and uh, so in this case, what we found, and usually was, when something came out and it was written about um, and it turned out to be false, the sort of debunking never got as much attention as the original, often mistaken, attention. And this is a way that news websites and journalists play a role in putting misinformation out there when you know, we're not even necessarily trying to do that, but this is one way where we can do that if we're not careful about how we do headlines or if we just don't seem to care and want to get the clicks. And the data on the bottom, just so you know, is um, you know, the categorizing of the different articles that wrote about this. So the articles with the green dots had written about it like it was true. And then when it was debunked, we did see more articles written, but they got far less social media engagement. Um, people were more interested in the sort of, this happened, this crazy new thing. And, and that's a problem with news, and it, and it does lead to misinformation. Uh, another thing that's really, really powerful and really relevant right now, particularly in politics, are partisan sites. Uh, and we did some analysis a few months ago where we took a selection of um, sites on the right and sites on the left and their Facebook pages, and we analyzed everything they published. We fact-checked everything they published and, and rated it in terms of mostly true, mixture true and false, mostly false. Uh, and, and we also looked at the engagement. And, and so we'll, we'll look at the data on that in a second, but like, this is an example of the kind of thing that we saw where this was a, a more uh, right-leaning page, a pretty you know, hyper-partisan right-leaning page where they wrote this post and they said basically, you know, they talked about Black Lives Matter and then they talked about um, a black man lighting two white people on fire and it being in, uh, on, you know, on video. And so we clicked through and we looked at it and we realized, okay, first of all, this video is a year old. It has nothing to do with Black Lives Matter whatsoever. So that was totally misleading. And then actually it turns out the original dispute was, was between one man, uh, an African American man, and another man who was not white. Um, so they, they created a whole racial element to this that arguably was not there at all. Uh, and they, they linked it to Black Lives Matter. They presented it as new. And so just layer after layer. And the key thing here is if you look at that, that last line, share if you're angry as hell and aren't going to take it anymore. They made a, a call to people's emotion. And this is, this is one of the ways to get people to share things and to react to things on the internet, and especially on Facebook. The more that we emotionally react to something, the more that me as somebody who, you know, if, if I was someone who does not support Black Lives Matter, um, this is something that would probably get me very, very angry, and I would probably share this post, and I would probably comment on it, I would probably react to it. And that's, that's what they're going for. Um, and so this was extremely, extremely misleading. Um, and this was another post, more from the left side, uh, that we saw where there was reports that James Comey, the FBI director, had put a, uh, a Trump sign on his lawn. So what actually happened? Um, well, so James Comey has a house that he hasn't lived in for years that he's been trying to sell. And somebody put a Trump sign on the lawn of the house that he has not lived in in years and that is you know, open and available for anyone to walk up on the, line, on the lawn. And so this started with someone taking a photo of a Trump sign on the lawn of James Comey's old house. And that's the headline you get from it. We called up the realtor, we called up a few people, and they're like, yeah, he doesn't live here. You know, anyone could have put that sign there. So this is totally, totally misleading. And it's, and it's not exclusive to one ideological point of view. Uh, and Because we seek out information that confirms what we believe. And so we love, if, if we think James Comey cost Hillary Clinton the election, we love that, right? You want to read that. And that's what people go for. Uh, so I mentioned we analyzed the data. And you know, the bottom line of it, the sort of the sad truth of it is that the stuff that was outright false or a mixture of true and false tended to get more engagement. Um, we saw a higher number of shares. And shares is like the most important thing on Facebook for, for generating traffic and engagement. Uh, and the other category that's really to, of note here is the clear box uh, on the far right for each of them. So the other category we had for posts was no factual content, meaning that there wasn't a claim being made here. And this is the category that most memes fell into. So it'd be like an image of, you know, with maybe a joke about Clinton or a joke about Trump or, you know, a video. And these memes were often very, very partisan and they were very much going for emotion, but they weren't necessarily listing facts. And those performed the best. Um, part of it is that if you put up a link on Facebook, people have to click through. So if you just get an image and you can see that right away, the engagement is higher. But also when it plays specifically to emotion, it does really well. 
And this is what's kind of going on in our media environment is Facebook is rewarding the posts and the content that gets the most engagement. And people know that the more I appeal to people's beliefs, the more I appeal to their emotions, the more I get that engagement. And so this is, this is where the direction is going. And we saw a lot of this during the election of very, very partisan stuff multiplying and multiplying. You know, kids in Macedonia doing it. Um, tons of new sites that I saw emerging in 2016 because suddenly it was a really good business. And, you, and the more you played to people's beliefs and anger, the more traffic and engagement you got. Uh, and so one of the, I think one of the things that's also going on here besides the digital environment is that if you look at numbers of trust in the media going over several decades, it's been on a steady decline. And it's not just media. People in general are, have less trust in government. They have less trust in big institutions. And the press is seen as a big institution. We're seen as part of the power structure. And, uh, and as that trust declines, I think people are obviously looking for other sources. And online now, in your Facebook feed, you, know, you can see what your friends are reading. And people are targeting stuff for you based on your ideological beliefs or other things. And so, so what happens is the more you consume, consume certain things, the more the algorithm in Facebook is going to feed you more of that. And if what you like is the stuff that gets you angry or makes you happy or tells you what you want to hear, you're going to get more and more of that. And eventually, that's all you're getting. Uh, and so there is a kind of a, an element of polarization that's happening. And a couple of examples of this, uh, if you think about the, um, the Brexit uh, in the UK, this is a visualization here of discussion on Twitter. And so you know, folks who wanted to, uh, to leave are over on the right. Folks who wanted to stay are over on the left. And there's really not a lot of overlap between the conversation. So people are having these conversations and living these lives uh, on social media, and they're not really interacting and encountering people who have a different point of view. There's, the conversation is really of like-minded people. And that's, that's natural. We, as humans, we tend to seek out people who are, who are similar to us, not just with beliefs, but in other ways as well. Uh, and there's a thing that's, that's called group polarization, which is the more that we're surrounded by people who have the same beliefs as us, the more extreme our beliefs tend to get, uh, because we're all reinforcing each other. Uh, and so, Arguably, some of the algorithms are creating this effect on a, on a larger scale as well. Uh, another example here of polarization, this is a visualization done by uh, Jonathan Albright, who's a journalism professor and, uh, um, and does some programming. And so there's big red clusters here, which are more right-leaning sites, and there's some blue clusters, which are left-leaning sites. And you can see they all sort of, this is them um, and how much they're linking out to different sites. So you can see that they're kind of linking to each other and reinforcing each other's stuff. But there's not a lot of clusters where the, where the, the blue and the red are together. And, and some of the big ones that you see there are the more mainstream sites, like you know uh, a Washington Post or what have you. But, uh, but for the most part, there, there's this huge ecosystem of partisan and, and in many cases, very hyper-partisan sites. Uh, and I think a lot of people are, are increasingly maybe just getting their news and information from those. And that's not to say partisan media is bad. It's, we've had partisan media for a long time. It was the original newspapers were very partisan. Um, but it's, it's different when you can be put off into a filter bubble and that's all you get. And it's different when sometimes misinformation is flowing very rapidly through all those kinds of sites. Um, and I think this was a good comment here. Uh, whoever has the most people and activates them the most effectively determines what truth is. That sort of feels like what's going on at times, right? Uh, and, and so when you think about that infrastructure of all those, all those sites, and you think about the different players, people who are creating misinformation, people who are helping spread that misinformation, it's, there's the entire networks of people who are dedicated to really winning out. And it's, it doesn't really matter how true the stuff is. It matters how good you are, how big your network is, how much you can activate it. And then you can win out with the discussion. And, and that's kind of a frightening thing to think about. But I do think that's one of the elements of what we're seeing in media today. Uh, so fake news, right. So we've talked about a bunch of different types here. Um, fake news, I, so I analyzed some data to find some of the biggest fake news hits of 2016, and not surprisingly, um, political news was, was really big. Um, crime was another big area. Fake stories about crazy crimes tend to do really well. So when I think about fake news, um, there's sort of, for me, there's like three, three key criteria on that. The first is it has to be 100% false. So we're not talking about you know, a, a news article that gets a couple things wrong. Um, we're not talking about uh, a story on a partisan site that has maybe an aggressive headline, but you know, the facts are all there. We're talking about something that's 100% false, that was created consciously to be false. And then the third thing that I put in there is, is an economic motive. Because for me, if it's ideologically driven, I consider that to be propaganda. 
And so fake news for me is totally false, consciously created as being false for a financial motive. And that's how I distinguish it. Admittedly, it's irrelevant what I say because the president is calling CNN fake news and you know, there's nothing I can do to stop that. He called us a failing pile of garbage. So I'm not sure if that's like better or worse than fake news. Um, we'll find out sometime maybe. Uh, and so, so that's how I view fake news. And you, know, you can see sort of the trend here. A lot of the fake news that I saw in the analysis we were doing, the stuff that performed better did tend to be more pro-Trump or anti-Clinton. And I think, there's, I think there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that I, I think his, his base and people were maybe more passionate for him than perhaps folks were passionate for Clinton. Um, and that's you know, speculation on my part. And, I, and when people have that passion and that emotion, it stuff performs well. And so people who are creating fake news see that. And if the, the pro-Trump stuff and the anti-Clinton stuff performs well, then they just make more of it. And at a certain point, the market just kind of took over. And that's why the teens in Macedonia you know, a year ago when they started launching their sites, they weren't aggressively pro-Trump sites. Um, some of them even tried uh, pro-Bernie sites because he had a very passionate base at one point as well. But as, you know, it got closer to cl being clear that Trump was gonna win, uh, and as he sort of consolidated his support, what folks who were just trying to do whatever worked on Facebook and sent them traffic, what they realized was that the Trump stuff did better. And so we got more and more of that. It wasn't created necessarily by people who wanted Trump to win. It was by people who wanted to make money. And that's where the money was. Uh, and that's a wild thing to think about, the, you know, the politics potentially being somewhat affected by that. It's, and it, it, you know, that, that is kind of the dynamic. At a certain point, the momentum just took over. Um, so as I said, I've been looking at fake news sites. Uh, started in 2014. So in about 2015, I had a list. And it was probably about 12 to 15 sites. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, my list right now, it's gotten a little bit bigger. This is actually not all of them. Um, so I work at BuzzFeed, I have to make a GIF. Like, I have to have one GIF in every presentation. So this is it. That's my GIF. Uh, so this, this is roughly, it was 96, but we actually just published a story today about five more. So we're over 100, congratulations. Um, and, and, you know, they crop up all the time, and it's also really kind of frustrating for me because, I mean, I'm covering it all the time, and we just, we just did a story. Our team in Japan wrote about a guy who started doing fake news there, and he, he wrote, he did fake news in Japanese, but he played on the fact that um, some people in Japanese, uh, there's, there's some tension between Japan and Korea, and so he wrote fake news for Japanese people who hate Koreans, I mean, and he attacked the, the hate and the anger part of it. And when, when, when our journalists in Japan sat down and asked him, like, why did you do this? He said, well, I read about these teens in Macedonia who were doing it, and I thought I'd give it a try here. So I'm like, great. So we think we're exposing it, but we're also you know, giving people the idea. So I don't, I don't know what to do about that. Um, but you know, it is an increasingly global phenomenon. We've done stories not just in Japan. Um, you know, I'll talk about one I did in Canada. And uh, in Brazil, uh, it's big. But it's different in different countries. Not, Facebook isn't as big in other countries as it is here. In Brazil, WhatsApp is huge. And in India, WhatsApp is huge. And a lot of the stuff spreads that way. So it's, there are different ecosystems in different parts of the world. Um, but the other thing I want to note is that fake news, in a lot of ways, is not completely new. So in 1835, this newspaper launched in New York. It's called The, the Sun. And it was very unique because every, pretty much every other newspaper at that time in New York cost about six cents. And so it was aimed at like the merchant class and above uh, who were buying newspapers. It had smaller circulation. They earned most of their money from circulation. They had a few ads. And a guy named Benjamin Day came along and said, um, OK, I'm, I want to try it a different way. He said, I'm going to charge a penny for my newspaper. I'm going to try to get as many readers as I can. And then I'm going to sell advertising and make the money from that. So this was kind of the birth of mass media in a lot of ways. And, uh, and so how do you get lots of people buying your newspaper? Well, a lower price is good, but also just print crazy shit, part of my language. But that's the other thing he realized. And so at one point, they ran like a six-part series and said that a famous astronomer had gone to South Africa with an amazing new telescope and they had actually for the first time seen what was on the moon, and it was filled with half men, half bats. And that's, that's what they did. They did a, a series of this, and it, circulation went up. Uh, it, I looked at this a bit in, in the book I did a while ago. And they, so they, 
Not only did they lie about that, they also lied about how much their circulation increased when you looked at the records. They claimed they were bigger than the Times of London. They may not have gotten there, but he saw a huge spike in that. And uh, so making stuff up for money and for, for distribution and to attract attention is not completely new. We have some new factors now, but it, it's existed. It existed in, in media uh, a long time ago, and it's usually connected to kind of mass distribution is, I think, one of the, the key factors when we see it popping up. Uh, and so when we think about today, what are one of the things that's different? Well, you know, net, a networked world is, is a very different thing. And this, this just shows like active users for some of the largest social platforms in the world. And these numbers are probably already out of date. Um, I think Facebook is now over 1.8 billion. Uh, 1.8 billion people are on Facebook every month. There has never been anything like that in human history. It's astounding. Um, and, you know, I cover Facebook a lot. And I cover it like I would cover the government because they're, they're just as powerful in many ways. Uh, and you have, to, you have to think about accountability and you have to think about their impact on the world. And, uh, but, and also other, you know, WhatsApp, as I mentioned, is, is really important. So that networked world is a new thing. Um, and what's also different is we have a massive abundance of information. So the amount of content that's being created and distributed every day over these networks is, is just amazing, and it's overwhelming. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to the idea of feeling overwhelmed with information and maybe sometimes wanting to tune out. And I think that's maybe why we sometimes gravitate towards stuff that just reinforces what we want to hear and what we believe, because that's, that's easier. That's not as challenging for us. Uh, and, and the two key pieces here on the bottom, one, I've talked a little bit about the algorithms in Facebook that sort of determine what you're going to see. That algorithmic filtering is, is really, really profound and, and it plays a huge role in this stuff. And it's not just on Facebook. With your search results on Google, you, you have some customization there, whether you realize it or not, based on your past behavior as well. So they're dictating a lot of what we see and a lot of what we engage with. Um, the other thing that's really important to note is that uh, you know, before, you might have to buy printing presses or you know, it was very expensive to, to create something and get it out there. And now it's very, very easy. I mean, the kids in Macedonia, they set up, uh, you know, they'll pay like 10 bucks to get a domain name, and then they'll, they'll set up a hosting account, which maybe costs, you know, $50, $100 a year, and then they'll use WordPress, which is a great tool for setting up a website. And then they just copy and paste stuff from other sites and try to get it to, to move on Facebook. So it doesn't cost a lot to do this. Uh, you know, I did a story about guys in Kosovo and Vietnam who were running fake Native American Facebook pages selling ripped off goods, and it was easy for them to do that. Uh, so that lower barrier to entry kind of cuts both ways. Um, so when we think about fake news today, one, I talked about financially driven. Um, I mostly see a lot of smaller sites, somebody running one or two. Um, the biggest one I found uh, was over 40 being run by one guy. I'll show you examples from that in a second. Um, mostly they're setting up with what's called programmatic advertising, which means you just sign up with like Google AdSense and the ads uh, are matched to your page based on the content. And you get a, if you do well, you get a check every month. Uh, and it's just like set up and easy. And, uh, and you know, at the core of it, it's like you know, attention is their crop. They're just trying to harvest as much attention as they can possibly get through Facebook, through other means, to get that onto the page. And the more page views they get, the more money they get. And um, what the content is doesn't matter. The guys in Macedonia were running health sites before they realized that it would do well with politics. It doesn't matter to them what it is. And it doesn't matter whether it's true. Uh, and there's a human component that's really important with this. So as I've mentioned, you know, we love information that confirms what we already think and, and what we feel. Um, we're, we're we quickly develop an irrational loyalty to our beliefs and work hard to find evidence that supports those opinions and to discredit, discount, or avoid information that does not. So you know, confirmation bias and also an, an element of we, we think when we're reading information, we're looking at it rationally, and we're not. And this affects all of us. And I always emphasize this extra for journalists, because we think somehow we're set apart from this. But you know, none of us purely rationally consume information. It's all processed through existing beliefs, existing knowledge. And just being aware of that is, is one of the best things to sort of not be fooled by stuff today. The other thing is that rumors uh, and claims uh, and the spreading of these things, it's a very natural human behavior. As we try to understand the world around us, as we try to fill in the blanks on things we don't know, um, we, we try to sort of come up with an idea. Uh, and this is, this is what humans have been doing forever. We, you know, we don't know something, so we talk about what it might be. And so socially, we create um, a potential explanation, and then that starts to spread. So rumors are very natural. 
And so when we see something related to the news or what have you, and we think, well, that could happen, or, oh, that might explain that thing I was wondering about, we'll take that information in and, and not necessarily sit there and say, okay, wait, where is this coming from and, and what are these claims? Uh, here, are, here are my two uh, fellow Canadians, um, two teenagers who run three fake news websites that almost exclusively write about Justin Trudeau. Uh, uh, their best month was about 10 grand that they earned. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a quote from one of them. Uh, you know, I asked him, like, what's the secret to writing fake news? And he said, you realize that people believe a lot of things online, so we use that to our advantage. He also said, just tell them what they want to hear. Uh, and in Canada, it turns out, people want to hear stories about Justin Trudeau and weed. That's what they, that's what they mostly write about. They d they've done some Trump content, too. Uh, and I, you know, it's weird, because these are, they're really, they're really nice guys. They're smart kids. They have some programming skills. And, and like, they're doing this, and th it doesn't occur to them like the effects of it. And a lot of their stories are kind of funny. But they've also done, they also did a story of like Justin Trudeau was arrested for domestic assault. And they did a story, uh, a, a fake story about a Syrian refugee uh, being arrested for terrorism in Canada. And so, you know, so when, when that's part of it as well, and that is, is feeding into people's fears, you know, that's, that's changing how we all see each other and how we all see society. And that's, it's a dangerous thing. I mentioned the guy who was running more than 40 sites. So we found this guy in California. His day job is a pilot. But he, was, he had more than 40 sites. He'd done, I think it was like more than 700 fake news articles just last year alone. Uh, and I actually, I flew to California and, and to try and find him in person. Uh, he didn't, he didn't want to talk to me. I'm so surprised, you know? Um, and so you can see here the scam that he was running is he realized that, OK, so emotion is one thing that can get people to work. But another one is kind of familiarity and uh, relatability. And so what he did was he matched two very important things together. The first was, let's take a celebrity. Let's take uh, someone you know, well-known. And two, let's take a location. And so the reason he did hundreds and hundreds of articles and all these sites was because he realized, well, in order for this to work, I need to hit all these different communities. And so you know, they, they wouldn't go mega viral, but it would get shared in that community. And so he just kept changing the celebrity name and the place name and just cranking these out. And then he did variations on it. He did one variation of like, you know, Johnny Depp had this to say about the women of Wichita, Kansas, you know? <laughs> and he just, he kept changing it and morphing it. And this is one of these scenarios where, where you know, it's kind of infuriating, but I was also like, ah, damn it, you're clever. That was like, that was kind of, kind of smart. Um, he's since been kicked off of Google AdSense. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, and that happens to a lot of the people that we write about, but there's lots of other ad networks they can go to. It's very hard to stamp this out. They can find other ways to make money. You know, the Macedonians, I'm probably not welcome in Macedonia now. Um, I've, one guy actually sent me an invoice for 5,000 euros for his income lost. Uh, this is like a 17-year-old. I was like, wow, you're, you're probably going to be really successful if you have, you know, the balls to do that. Uh, so, you know, but it's hard. Even when they're exposed and they get kicked off of one ad network, they can go on to another one. Uh, and so when it comes to the election, as I said off the top, for me, I think of it, it just combined all of the things that will make misinformation run rampant. And so things that we've talked about. One, a presidential cycle attracts a huge amount of attention, not just in the US, but around the world. And this one was a particularly crazy cycle, so even more attention, right? Um, so that's good. For attention harvesters, that's what they need. Um, the emotion and strong beliefs component, really, really important, because we know people react to stuff that reinforces what they want to hear, um, things that get an emotional reaction. Um, you know, it, reading something that makes you happy doesn't make you react as strongly as something that makes you angry, something that makes you disgusted. And people know that, and they cater to that. Um, and the other thing is, uh, in general, in politics, there's a fair amount of spin and misinformation. You know, Donald Trump is frankly very unique because of the amount of uh, totally false things that he says. And so when you have, you know, a major, uh, a major candidate who is, will consistently say things that are not true, it sort of lays the groundwork and, and opens the area for lots of other crazy things that are not true to be said as well. And so that amount of misinformation, it, um, you know, it, it almost opens the door more for more of it. And then the other one that we've talked about as well is that element of the you know, big social and networking platforms and algorithmic filtering. Um, I, I don't think Facebook had any idea that a lot of stuff that was false and misleading was getting as much traction as it was. You know, their platform is so big, it's impossible to monitor it at that level. Um, you know, those, those fake Native American pages that I found, like, they didn't know that was going on. And when I showed them to them, obviously, they took some action. But it's impossible when you're that big 
to actually monitor this stuff. And it's the same thing with Google. There, to get into AdSense, you're supposed to actually create original content or add value to the content that you're aggregating. And so by those rules, the, mag the, the Macedonians should have never gotten in because they were literally copying and pasting. But it's very difficult when you have almost 2 million publishers, 2 million websites, as AdSense does, to actually control that. And so people take advantage of that. Uh, and it, so one of the things I did after the election, I wanted to get a sense of um, like how big did some of the fake political news go. And uh, so I used my list of sites and did some searches and things like that and, and looked nine months before the election, six months before, and three months before, and looked at the number of Facebook engagements. So that's the total number of the shares, the reactions, and the comments for those pieces of content. And I wanted to just sort of see, like, well, what was the trend on that? And so the fake news one, you see, like, it had this upward kick in those critical three months before the election. And to kind of benchmark it, I took 19 of the biggest news websites uh, in the English language news websites in the US and, and tried to see, like, OK, of their content, just about the election for both of them, what was their engagement level? And it's imp important a couple of caveats on this. The first is that, of course, those big sites get way more traffic than fake news websites. And also, if you look at this and you think, oh, fake news got Trump elected, that's, that's also not valid. You know, there's a lot of reasons why he won. But there was a spike in misinformation. And the stuff that was completely false did do really well on Facebook. And in this comparison, when you throw it up against 19 mainstream, big mainstream sites, the, the fake news engagement for the top 20 stories ended up having more. Um, doesn't mean they got more traffic overall. Uh, it doesn't mean that there was more misinformation than accurate information. But in a benchmarking exercise like that, I mean, that's crazy. Because these sites are run often by people in their spare time. They don't have staff writers. Um, you know, we're talking about that compared to like Washington Post, New York Times, CNN, NBC, ABC, on and on and on. And so they shouldn't even be close to each other. And yet that happened. Uh, so, so again, it was that, that perfect storm. And, and I think what's happened is people have kind of woken up to this a little bit. And Facebook is taking some action now, and Google is taking some action, and people are talking a lot about this stuff. And those are, these are all really good things. But it's also very complex, and there's no easy solution. I don't, I don't have the solution. Uh, you know, and as much as I document this stuff, it all makes me really think in a lot of ways is how difficult it is and how complicated it is to, to stamp this stuff out. Uh, and so just to, to wrap up some of the key pieces here, um, the first is that it, there's a huge battle for attention. There's so much information. There's so much content out there that people are really fighting to get your eyeballs. Um, and they're often using cheap, cheap things like emotion and other things um, to get at you. The piece on the platforms, you know, I emphasize that with Facebook, it's more than 1.8 billion people on it now. And that is just like, it's just unheard of. We've never had anything like that in the history of, of, of human existence. And it really is something that is completely unprecedented. And that's why I think you know, Facebook was, was taken off guard by some of this. Because when you're that big, like, there's no way you can have a handle on everything that's going on. Uh, the piece of algorithms and just being aware of, of the information that you're receiving and consuming and how much algorithms are playing a role in that and how much they're playing a role in your friends and your family and others is really important to be aware of that and understand um, that they're extremely powerful. And yes, they're programmed by humans. Um, but I think too often, we think about an algorithm as something that lacks bias. But they're absolutely biased. And one of the things they're biased towards is the stuff that makes you react really strongly. And, and that, in the election, was really partisan stuff. Um, so there is a bias there. And what you're seeing is not the full reality. It's a selected reality customized for you. And that's always important to keep that in mind. Um, the other thing that's really disappointing is, is how much of a business opportunity there is in misinformation uh, and how easy it is to get into the market, how, how little money you need to spend, how little time you have to spend to actually earn some. And, and I think that's really one of the things that's been contributing to kind of the, the pollution of, of the information environment. Uh, I want to leave you with something from someone that people in Chicago might be familiar with. Uh, uh, it was a weird thing to, to see all of a sudden, you know, before he, he left the presidency, Obama starts to really talk a lot about misinformation. And, and you know, he's a very eloquent person. And, and I think he summed up, a, you know, kind of what the danger is very well. Um, and he talks about a media environment where everything is true and nothing is true, and the capacity to disseminate misinformation while conspiracy theories, to paint the opposition in wildly negative light without any rebuttal, that has accelerated in ways that much more sharply polarize the electorate and make it very difficult to have a common conversation. That's, that's the thing that, at the core of it, 
I really I worry about, specific to politics and other areas, is you know, for a long time there was kind of a middle. There was a set of shared facts. There was disagreement. You know, I don't want everybody to agree, even though I'm Canadian and we like that. I, that's not really what I want. Uh, and, but if you don't actually have a shared set of facts, if you can't actually agree on what reality is, and you're off and you're being fed information that polarizes you more and more, you know, what, does, what does that do to society as a whole? What does it do to the political conversation? And that's one of the things I worry about. And in terms of media itself, uh, uh, you know, the growth of these partisan sites has really been massive. And, and if that continues, it's more and more people will perhaps only be getting information from partisan sites. And I think partisan sites can, can be a great part of any, you know, any media consumption diet. Maybe only one type of media, whether it's partisan media or other types, is not a good thing. Diversity is a really important element in that. And so that's the thing that I worry about. Um, but I also, you know, on a more positive note, there's more people thinking about this, working in this area, caring about this area. Uh, and I think that that's a really positive thing. So I'm looking forward to taking your questions, and I, I really appreciate all of you coming out today. Thank you. So we, ne we have to start with students, right? OK, so a student here, up in front. You're a student as well? All right. So we'll go one, two, three. OK. Don't worry, I like this side of the room too. We'll get to you guys. Uh, thank you for the very insightful presentation. Um, I have two questions. First, um, how much impact do you think fake news and false polling data had on the election? And second, um, more related to your research method, how do you go about tracking at and identifying fake news sites? Right, so the impact question is, is it's a really hard one to answer. Uh, and you know, I said, if you think fake news gave Trump the win, you know, that's wrong. And so one is that just uh, evaluating media effects, oh, you saw this or you read this, so you did that, is extremely difficult. And, and I say that not because that's my area of expertise, but having spoken to sociologists and other people, they say that that's a very difficult thing to quantify. Uh, and so my, my general statement about the impact of fake news on the election is that uh, you know, I think it, con it contributed to polarization. Uh, I think there may have been people who, uh, you know, who were maybe a little more in the middle, and maybe some people got pulled a little bit more. And people who are already had their minds made up, maybe went from being, you know, uh, pro one person to being very anti another person. <clears throat> and and so not just about who they decided to vote for, but also their perceptions of, you know, the other party, and also perceptions of just people on the other side. Uh, so I think that's one of the effects it had was probably it polarized people a little bit more. Because one of the arguments that I tend to agree with about fake news is that people who may be more inclined to consume it are already perhaps a little more polarized. And so I think that one of the most likely effects is probably increased polarization. Um, the other thing that I think it does in, in a more general way is it just you know, it adds more noise and more confusion to the information ecosystem. And so <clears throat> it prevents some people from getting perhaps accurate, more credible information. Maybe it's a little bit of a barrier. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that fake news, reading one fake news article is going to make somebody vote one way or another. Like, I don't think that happens. But I do think that what happens is if it's, if it's going at that amount of engagement, then there's more people being exposed to it. And it just becomes part of their thinking over time. Uh, and that's what research into rumors tells us, is that there is a connection between repetition and believability. So the more you see this stuff going around, the more you see stuff about paid protesters, the more likely, at some point, it's just going to get in there. Um, so I think that maybe is like a more long-term effect. And then you asked about how, um, how I track and sort of find these folks. Um, so I, I, it's a mixture of just you know, being a little bit obsessive about it uh, and like stuff that fl So I use Twitter a lot. Um, I follow you know, people who are interested in this area as well. So I kind of curate that. I use some different tools to see what types of content about certain things are spreading online. There's a tool called BuzzSumo, which is what I use to, to do that analysis there. Uh, and, and increasingly now, I'm, I'm getting some tips from people. The story today about this Hollywood film paying for fake news, there was a tip that had come in originally a um, little more than a week ago that somebody sent to me. Uh, and then the other piece of it is that over time, if you start to know a little bit of the players um, and recognize their sites. Like now, it's really weird. Now if I come across uh, a website and, or a Facebook page, there's something that will like tickle in the back of my head and I'm like, I think this is Macedonian. Uh, and it's really weird, you know? Um, and, and we just had a story last week where a bunch of big Macedonian Facebook pages 
took a, a fake story that had been out uh, you know, a month ago and just brought it back to life. And it was like, unbelievable. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of different methods. There's some tools, and, but a lot of it is just like, I just, I'm obsessed with this stuff and I just look for it every day. And, and I also, fortunately, I have colleagues who will send stuff my way as well and, and look at that. So it's a combo of a few things. Uh, yes, you were over here. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to articulate this, um, but it seems like you're, you sort of give an account of a problematic incentive structure that rewards um, hucksters, yeah. basically. And that there's um, basically a common thread uniting this phenomenon with um, this, this earlier paper, which also figured out that there, there just seems to be a problem with the idea of news making money because it it, right. it it will like it seems to inevitably produce this thing, um, so it seems like you have to be somehow hold the people accountable who create these incentive structures, so like AdSense and Facebook. Yeah. Um, so is that does that seem like what people are, is that how people are approaching this problem now, mm -hmm. or is it like sort of piecemeal attacking the um, con artists? Um, well, there's a little bit of both going on. Uh, so, I mean, I think, I think you articulated that well, by the way. Like, the incentive structures are one of the things that's driving this. And also, the thing with news is that uh, when, when it's the news itself that is your main business model, I do think that you tend to move towards the more sensationalized and that kind of thing. But for a long time, if you take newspapers, news wasn't the main thing that they made money from. There was, there was the news part of it, and then there were classifieds, and there were flyers, and, uh, and then there was you know, more servicey information. And so like that core accountability journalism, like people didn't really pay for that. They paid for this nice bundle that got delivered to them that offered a whole bunch of different things, whether it was the crossword or what have you. And that bundle has been stripped away, and so a lot of local newspapers, what's left is the news piece, and the news piece in and of itself is something that unfortunately a lot of people don't want to pay for. Uh, and so online when it's when it is you know when it's your content that you need to attract people then you tend to move towards you know more sensationalized headlines and and that kind of thing um, so on the on the part of the, the role of like AdSense which is Google and and Facebook uh, I think there there are uh, they they're under more pressure now than they've ever been and uh, and so some of that pressure comes from some reporting uh, some of it is just um, the public frustration with what's going on, and some of it is also coming from governments, and it depends on the different countries. Uh, for example, in Germany, they, they don't hesitate to regulate companies, and they, they also have very strict hate speech laws, and so um, you know, right now there's a Syrian refugee who's trying to get an injunction against Facebook uh, in, in a German court. And, uh, and an, a German politician is talking about fining Facebook, I think it's like 500,000 euros if they don't remove uh, fake news fast enough. So they're, ex they're experiencing a lot of pressure and their response to that has been, uh, Facebook is now running kind of a, a fake news program, uh, working with third party fact checkers like PolitiFact to try and, and fact check fake news. They're trying to knock out some of the financial incentives for spammers and Google, announced uh, just a little while ago that they had knocked uh, about 200 publishers, I think it was, out of AdSense. Now, uh, 200 out of almost 2 million is a, a small amount. Uh, and, and none of these companies will give me, will tell me who they're booting and why they're booting them. And so as much as we need to attack the problem, we also have to be aware of unintended consequences, which is that I don't want Facebook and Google deciding only what I get. And I don't want them censoring people because Inevitably, if they're so big, you know, they're going to do a bad job. Uh, inevitably, there's some things are going to slip through that shouldn't be a part of their programs. And then if they're knocking people out, they'll probably knock out some people that shouldn't be knocked out. So I think the transparency piece is important. But right now, you know, there's more momentum around all this stuff. They're under more pressure than they've been. Uh, they're putting some money behind and some initiative behind the problem. But it's a, it's a big and complex problem. So, you know, these are the early first steps. Um, so yes, you back there had a question. Here, wait, the mic is coming for you. When you talk, when you talk about engagement with a particular piece of news, it's like comments plus shares plus likes. Right. That, that, there's a potential for there to be like, repeating, right? Like the same person likes and comments and shares, that would be counted three times. Right. Okay. Yes, yeah. 
Uh, so okay, so the, the the other question is: Is there any kind of up and coming uh, certification system that you know of uh, to distinguish a good site from a bad site that might uh, right. that might raise the barrier to entry that you were talking about earlier? Yeah. Um, so this is this is one of the conversations that's happened in in the wake of of sort of concerns about fake news. Is I don't know if you guys have seen this, but. At one point, there were these sort of fake news lists that were circulating of like, you know, here's 300 fake news websites that you shouldn't read. And I think there were a couple of browser plugins built of like, if you're on one of these sites, it'll warn you. And, and like, I understand the tendency towards that. It'd be nice if we could decide, you know, what's good and what's bad. But there's, it's one, a lot of the sites that circulated mixed partisan news with 100% fake news, which is, I think, a terrible thing. And we don't want to do that. Uh, and so there is a risk in trying to certify like what's 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 good and what's not, and what's an acceptable uh, you know ideological take on something and what's not. And there's there is a danger there about censorship, and there's a potential danger to free speech. And I think that's the fact that we care about that is important. It yes, it makes the problem harder, but it's important to make the problem harder in that sense. So certification around um, types of information is really difficult, and and I think it's especially more difficult now in a much more democratized media environment where anybody can launch a site. I mean, I don't want to stop people from launching sites, right? Um, but I do think that it should be, you know, the people who have guidelines on their ad networks and what have you should enforce them better. And, and ideally, there should be some kind of, yeah, negative incentive for, for you know, making stuff up. Uh, it's, the, the incentives are more on why you should make stuff up now, unfortunately. Um, so personally, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of like the certification idea. I also think just feasibly, it's just really impossible to do that, and, and free speech-wise, potentially big concerns. So um, over here, all right, yes. Um, hi, so I was wondering, so looking at this past election and the effect that technology has, I think, on the way our society thinks and cognition for people, it's sort of like a blow in the face of this thought that technology is always positive and that the more information that right. people get, it's like we're gonna become a more and happier utopia, right? Um, and it also brings the challenge, like the idea that um, it's showing a lot of the shortcomings of human cognition, and, and it's showing that when we're given extreme efficiency, like with our ability to connect with people around the world and connect with our community, and also with recommender algorithms that optimize our engagement to the utmost amount, right? That like, if you're a Chicago economist, that would be a good thing, right? Because like, people are rational and right, they, whatever uh, media that they want to consume the most, right, right? It's of the most value to them and to society, but that's unfortunately not the case. Um, I was wondering, to what extent is this sort of hopeless in, in, changing, <laughs> in changing sort of like, I mean, can we as a society become more enlightened about the way we consume information mm -hmm. and, uh, if not, um, if so, how? And if not, right. to what extent can we use technology to help us sort of optimize towards better cognition about thinking about these issues? Right, yeah. Um, so, so I think one, one fundamental piece of it is, uh, is, is the element of we're, we're consuming information in a very different way from before. If you think about your Facebook news feed, the stuff all, like it's coming from a variety of different places. And it all kind of looks the same, right? It, you could have stuff from three different, very different websites, but it basically comes down to the thumbnail and the headline and how many people actually look at the URL under that. Not a lot of people. And that's a different way for us than choosing, this is the newspaper I'm going to read every morning, and this is the newscast I'm going to watch every night. So that element of it all being kind of pushed together, and then the element of it also coming from friends and family, you know, people that you really trust, and, and new data that's come out shows that we value stuff from friends, information coming from friends, just as much or more from, you know, like mainstream media outlets now. So this is all, it's very new, and, and it, it, we sort of, we interpret it and understand it through the way, you know, natural elements of human behavior, but it's very different. And so I do think there's an element of recognizing that and figuring out, okay, so how do we, how do we all kind of relearn how to consume information, which is a pretty like fundamental thing to think about. But I think it's true, and, I, and uh, there's a lot of talk around media literacy now of sort of teaching people how to look for the source, um, and, and that should be more a part of uh, schools. And I think, that's, I think that's a good piece of it. The other one, you know, you asked about the role of technology and potentially helping fix a problem that arguably technology has, if not created, but is, is acerbated. And, and there, are, you know, I, there are ways to build algorithms that 
uh, that build an, an element of information and diversity into it. Uh, the problem is that if you're Facebook and that me makes people spend less time on your platform, then you, your incentives are against you doing that. And so I, you know, I will say that just in the last few weeks, I've had a lot of conversations with people who work in artificial intelligence and, and other areas, and they're all really looking at this. And so I do think that there are technologists who are, are thinking about this, and, uh, and I'm, not, I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not overly pessimistic about it. Uh, there are things that I definitely worry about, but I also know that, you know, for example, in journalism, there was a period at the, in the late 1800s uh, where we, we look at it, back at it now as we call it yellow journalism, which was, you know, there was a lot of really bad reporting and stuff that was made up, uh, and, and, and the press kind of self-corrected a little bit and, and created new ethics codes, and it doesn't mean we were ever perfect, but I think that, you know, if you look at the history of human history, we, we, we do tend to find ways to move past these things. And so overall, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful, but you're right. There are huge human challenges. There are technological challenges. It's all, it, you know, it's a difficult thing. Um, all right. Let's go here. You would ask a question. And this gentleman here in the middle with the glasses, yes. Given fake news, and the proliferation of fake news on platforms such as Facebook for brand and product companies as well as media companies. How are they viewing platforms as Facebook for consumer engagement? Has any thinking changed in the last few months from being this ubiquitous vehicle to do one-to-one right. -one marketing, uh, which seemed to be the holy grail? Uh, has any of their thinking changed in terms of how they're going to engage and deploy these platforms going forward? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question because it's, it's not something that I had sort of uh, addressed. Uh, I think one of the things that's happened is a lot of brands, in some cases really big brands, have realized that their ads were ending up on these kinds of sites. And the reason for that is, you know, when they go and they do a media buy and they say, okay, we want to, you know, target men between 35 and 45, uh, you know, of this income bracket, and then somebody placing those that order kind of for online will f buy the inventory on sites that have that audience. And so the brand actually has no idea in a lot of cases what websites their, their ads show up on. And, and the fake news stuff has made them realize that, that their ads were showing up on some of these sites. And so I, I think that there is... And there's now like digital, um, digital agency uh, and associations that are really starting to talk about this and figure out like how did you know we've we've lost kind of that connection because before you would do a media buy and you'd be like we're going in these ten newspapers and we're going on these five TV shows and that's what we're going to do and everybody knew that and now they don't know uh, and so yes I think some brands are really starting to rethink that that programmatic automated piece of it and the other piece that uh, there's a lot of pushback from brands on when it comes to Facebook is that. Um, they weren't getting the data and there wasn't as much third party uh, validation of Facebook data as you might get when there are like third parties that review newspaper circulation. And so Facebook has just, I think it was just this week or last week, agreed to have a third party measurement come in. And this was after they had revealed that they had gotten some numbers wrong on video views and other things like that. So yeah, when I talk to people who are you know, high up at big agencies, uh, you know, there's some, there is some frustration there, and there's some concern that are they putting their best clients on really crappy websites, and uh, and so there's there's starting to be a little more discussion about that for sure. They're starting to think about it. Yeah. Um, all right, let's go to this gentleman right here. The other side of the coin of fake news is that Trump has taken to calling uh, what you could say is real news fake. An example of that was what he called CNN uh, uh, propagating fake news for referring to the uh, dossier on Trump's Russia connections, mm -hmm. which uh, BuzzFeed then put out. So my question is, it seems like as an alternative or another way of getting at fake news is to elevate the saliency of true news. And there is a time-honored trope of American storytelling, the, the detective story of trying to get at the bottom of what's really true. Right. So a lot of the fake news seems to be, uh, one, one feature of it is that it's a single phrase, a sound bite, whereas there should be yeah. something really compelling about an investigation <laughs> into 
uh, well, is a corroboration for the uh, dossier on Trump's Russia connections. So is that something that you are pursuing? Like uh, your, your, uh, the stories you've told today are mm -hmm. very compelling and exciting. So you could tell a story and make that something that people would come back to to find out uh, have we found the answer yet? Yeah, the, I mean, storytelling is still, you know, it's like the most powerful device that, that we have as, as journalists. And we do see, you know, we see good traffic numbers and engagement around this kind of stuff. Uh, and and you're, you're also very right that a lot of the, the stuff that's packaged, put out there, like it's based on one crazy quote or one crazy image and that kind of thing. And, uh, and it is harder to get the in-depth stuff to work. Uh, I remember looking when I was analyzing the data, you remember the New York Times got Trump's old tax return from one year. And the engagement on that story was, you know, like a fifth or worse than the best kind of fake news story on Facebook. But it probably got more traffic, but in terms of the exposure on Facebook, it was less. And so it is a challenge for journalists, you know, to make, to make the more substantive stuff uh, as interesting as possible. And also, frankly, to realize that in a lot of ways, uh, facts just in and of themselves like aren't enough. The fact that something is true doesn't is not going to make it inherently more interesting uh, to people. And it's you know it's a sad realization, but storytelling is an important piece of that. And thinking about how you know we can kind of flip it and recognize some of the techniques that folks use uh, for fake stuff, um, and how do we how do we create an emotional connection with something without being manipulative? So it is something we're thinking about. And for us, um, for this sort of small team that I have in this area. We're thinking about how do we create videos uh, for Facebook? Because sometimes an article is not the best way to get information out there. Can you do a 15 second video for Facebook? Can you do an image? That's probably going to work better. And so we have to also play to the mediums as well. Um, so I think we have time for one more right here up front. And I'm, I'm around after as well. So please come up and say hi. Hi, thanks. So tonight, a lot of scrutiny has been placed on the perverse incentives of avenue, uh, advertising revenue models. right? Do you see a future in alternative revenue models, whether it's subscription-based, tip jar-based, and whether they could, mm -hmm. one, be able to create a self-sustaining digital media platform that is able to compensate its content creators, and B, whether that would be net positive for the future of fake news? Yeah, I mean, the, the, this, the business models for news are, I mean, this is, this is one of the central questions facing journalism right now. Um, as much as we have traditional models declining, the new digital revenue has not has not taken over for that. You're exchanging, you know, people say this a lot, you're exchanging, you know, the the sort of traditional dollars for digital dimes. Uh, and it's just not as big. And the other piece of it is that um, if Facebook and Google in the United States have roughly about 80% of the digital advertising market. So so your newspapers, which have lost revenue and wanted to move to digital, that most of that revenue has been hoovered up by Facebook and Google because they have you know, very good, efficient platforms. And uh, so the sustainability of news is a big question. Um, in terms of for journalism of doing you know, better, good, and providing good information, yes, this is, this is something that we need to innovate on. Um, you know, New York Times has been pretty successful with the digital subscriptions model, but that doesn't work for everybody. And so you see a lot of media companies now trying to create a lot of different revenue drivers. So they do events, and sometimes they're selling products. Um, like we, we sell a thing at BuzzFeed called a fondoodler, which is, which is like a cheese gun. Uh, and, you know, we, and also when we were called a failing pile of garbage, we sold uh, merchandise that said that on it. But then we donated that money. Because um, you can't really, yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, and so, so the, the business model challenge is a significant one. Um, there's a lot of models around like you know, getting people to pledge a monthly amount. Um, there's models around doing events and getting people to pay for that. There's getting people to pay specifically for content. There's doing you know, premium reports, uh, like more sort of analyst style reports from more niche outlets. So a lot of people are trying a lot of things. But the truth is, and this is the thing that con really concerns me the most, is like, I think bigger outlets like us or like a New York Times are probably going to be OK. It's the small local papers and organizations that are really in crisis because that, that business model does not exist now. Nobody has come up with a new one. And so that's where we need to do a lot of innovation and figure that out. And there are, um, there's, there's organizations that are putting some money into trying to figure that out in journalism. And if we can certainly sustain and grow our newsrooms more, because we've had a lot of layoffs, can that push out some of the fake stuff um, and push out some of the lower quality ones? Potentially. Um, it's, but it's such a wide open market that it's, you know, it's not sort of one or the other. More of the good stuff is good. 
uh, it doesn't mean it'll necessarily replace the other stuff because it's, you know, it's, there's an infinite uh, opportunity there for, for putting the information out. Um, all right, well thank you. Thank you everyone. <laughs> <laughs>